Hello, hello, and welcome again to a Beatles talk show podcast, which is called Things We Said Today. This is a program where we talk about anything that has to do with the Beatles, their music, their history, any aspect of their careers from the past up through today. I'm Ken Michaels. I'm one of the three regular co-hosts of this show. You might know me for my syndicated radio program on the Beatles called Every Little Thing, currently on 38 radio stations. Or you might also know me for another talk show podcast on the solo Beatles that I do uh, called Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. And I'm being joined by my two other regulars. First of all, a man who's been a fixture on New York radio for well over 35 years now at New York's WFUV. He's done a lot of great work there, a lot of amazing interviews with people in the music industry, and he is their official Beatle guy there. If not, I've already ordained him such. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and that's uh, our own Darren DeVivo. Hi, Darren. Hey, guy. Uh, hey, Ken. Hey, Alan. How is everyone out there in uh, coronavirus land? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, it's been, for, for so many people, it's been a nightmare, but we'll talk about that in a moment. My other co-host, you know, for a couple of books that he's written, The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop, and also Got That Something, How the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, Changed Everything, wrote for many years and still does periodically for the New York Times for their classical department and also as a freelance writer uh, for the Wall Street Journal and lots of other publications, and that is Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hello, Ken, and hello, Darren, and everyone out there. <laughs> on today's just, show just, I, I, oh, I thought Alan might actually break into Hello Dolly there for a second <laughs> <laughs> Well he does have a hidden talent as a singer so I've been told so hmm. once in a while we're going to have to coax him into that hmm. Yeah alright Especially I know he's been rehearsing some Andrew Lloyd Webber stuff because oh. we're going to have to into the show <laughs> yeah, Please <laughs> <laughs> Don't cry for me, Argentina. He's working on it. I mm. promise you. Yeah. Mm. All right. <laughs> anyway, uh, on today's show, we're going to be doing a, a slightly different topic, more of a negative topic. And naturally, it came from Darren, uh, <laughs> this idea, which is um, disappointments from the Beatles in their solo careers. And so uh, we're each going to share our own opinions about certain things that happened in the solo careers of the Beatles that we were not happy about through the years. So that's going to be a super critical show from the three of us. And uh, we'll get to that in just a few moments. But as usual, we have the latest in Beatle news. Uh, first of all, uh, last Thursday, we heard of something that just started called the Inner Light Challenge. And the Material World Foundation, which was started by George Harrison in 1973, announced that they are donating half a million dollars to the Music Cares COVID-19 Relief Fund, Save the Children, and Medicines San Frontiers, that's Doctors Without Borders Charities. And uh, they are providing much needed aid and care during this COVID-19 pandemic. They are inviting us, all of us, to join the Inner Light Challenge by sharing a verse, chorus, or a line from the Beatles song and posting it online with, with the hashtag InnerLight2020 to help raise an additional $100,000 to combat the COVID-19 pandemic. And they're saying, sing it, play it, hum it, strum it, paint it, knit it, <laughs> chant it, plant it, pray or meditate and post it to social media. Danny Harrison, in fact, posted a video with him singing the song a cappella. He was sitting in the lotus position while he was doing this, and the only accompaniment was when he was kind of uh, stirring the edge of a, of a glass, kind of like a wine glass, and you get all those uh, sounds, kind of like what Paul did on the first McCartney album with glasses, that kind mm -hmm. of an effect. And uh, did either of you see Danny's video? Yep. Yes. What did you think of it, Alan? I thought it was good. You know, I mean, I, I really like that song. And uh, it was nice hearing it a cappella. And, uh, and I liked, you know, I think what he was doing with the uh, musical glass thing was it was really just sort of giving himself a drone, like, like 
an Indian ensemble would have with the tambours. So that right. was just sort of, you know, giving him the background to sing against. Uh, but um, yeah, it was a good clip. Mm. I, and I can't, I can't, I still can't believe how much he looks and sounds like his father. That was like watching George doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but I thought it was really nice. I, I, I didn't, I, I, you know, I wasn't cra- I, I wasn't sure how I could contribute like to the cause and do a video or, you know, but I really enjoyed uh, Danny's uh, version of that. Made me wonder if uh, like Danny, Danny should do like a bunch of his father's songs, maybe an album of, you know, interpretations of his dad's work. Maybe the spiritual songs would make a cool album. Well, remember that a few years ago he recorded For You Blue and he did that for a TV commercial, for a jeans commercial. Sounded really good doing it, too. Plus, he was part of, of course, uh, George Fest, performing a lot of his father's songs. Yeah, he should. uh, The more I think about it now, it would be a cool record, I think, if he did, you know, a kind of and his own modern uh, style, you know, uh, some of his father's maybe lesser tracks, lesser known songs. Could make for a pretty interesting uh, album. Mm. You know, and it's obviously a good song for the time, you know, uh, with everybody sort of, uh, you know, self-quarantining and stuff. You know, the lyrics, uh, without going out of my door, I can know all the ways, everything on earth, I can know all the ways of heaven. Uh, you know, it's it's kind of a, a good thought, you know, you don't have to go traveling, doing things, you can... Um, you can really find it all uh, inside. Uh, I think that was the idea of that song when it came out. And so it was a good choice. And, you know, with everybody sort of making uh, coronavirus playlists on Spotify, that's that's also mm. a good one to add to it. Yeah, it's the perfect song. And apart from the fact that Danny has been so involved with his own music in recent years, you know how proud he is of his heritage. Mm-hmm. And it shows uh, every now and then, whenever he either covers his father's music or embraces uh, everything that George stood for with his spirituality and all. Mm-hmm. So it certainly shows in this video. Very nice to watch. Also, uh, I suppose it was to be expected, but last Friday, Ringo Starr announced that his upcoming North American tour has been canceled due to the coronavirus. Ringo was quoted as saying, this is very difficult for me. In 30 years, I think I've only missed two or three gigs, never mind a whole tour. But this is how things are for all of us now. I have to stay in just like you have to stay in. And we all know it's the peace and loving thing we do for each other. So we have moved the spring tour to 2021. My fans know I love them and I love to play for them. And I can't wait to see you all as soon as possible. In the meantime, stay safe. Peace and love to you all. So we'll have to wait until the spring of next year to go along with that. All of Paul's European dates have been postponed. I've heard that already bought tickets remain valid. Replacement dates are currently being searched for, and this process will likely take some time. They will probably push the tour back to 2021. We can't say that for sure. Uh, One thing we do know is one thing that we missed this past weekend was the fest for Beatle fans in New York City. But to replace that, we had the virtual fest for Beatle fans and online for all three days. So many of the events that uh, were due to take place at the Hyatt in uh, New York took place online and we could watch it on the fest's own website, a special page that they developed. I was part of a panel for Talk More Talk and uh, we all discussed our top three favorite uh solo songs from each of the beatles actually ken womack joined us so we had five co-hosts in the show and i tackled solo paul and ken womack tackled just wings we kept that separate from the solo paul but uh so much of uh what would normally happen at the fest took place online lawrence juber did a full concert there were great performances from people like Scott Erickson, John Montagna, who we had as a guest a couple shows back, did his own bass clinic and demonstrated uh, some of the great bass work that Paul McCartney did with the Beatles and also in his solo career. A lot of great things online, and you can find quite a lot of that. I'm not sure if all of it's posted, but if you go to the Fest's own page on Facebook, a lot of that you can just watch now. 
And Ken Dashow from New York's Q104 interviewed Billy J. Kramer, uh, as well as Don Daneman from The Circle and uh, some other people. And that's that's also on the Fest page. So there's quite a lot there. Tom Franjoan, by the way, interviewed Peter Asher. Uh, so I'm sure that's on the Fest page as well. So um, And we also know that it has been rescheduled, the Fest for Beatles fans, for uh, a very easy weekend to remember, which is the weekend of John's birthday. It's October 9th, 10th, and 11th. Okay, so keep that in mind. I have been told that if you bought tickets for this past weekend, uh, they will honor that at the rescheduled date. So if you bought a ticket for Saturday, it'll work for that weekend, uh, October 9th, 10th, and 11th. It'll work for that Saturday and so on. All right. Just announced last week is a new book coming out on October the 8th called John and Yoko Plastic Auto Band. It lists both John and Yoko as authors. It's 288 pages long, includes a preface from Yoko, includes chapters with titles from every song on John's Plastic Auto Band album, plus chapters called Who Are the Plastic Auto Band, Collaboration, Live Performance, Catharsis, and uh, one on the album's the album's artwork. This book is now available for pre-order on Amazon. Both Plastic Ono Band albums are celebrating its 50th anniversary in December this year, which leads to speculation if there will be an archival box set for John's album. Now, the second half of this year looks to be shaping up to be very eventful in terms of archival releases with Flaming Pie, the box set, due out July 24th. The Beatles film, The Beatles Get Back in movie theaters on September the 4th, and audio and video releases for that and the Let It Be material in the fall. We've heard plans are underway for a 50th anniversary release for All Things Must Pass, and now possibly for the Plastic Ono Band album. So, time for us to uh, take out some loans (laughs) so we can afford uh, all this stuff. It's going to be another very expensive uh, last half of the year. Uh, for Beatle fans. Also, the Beatles are on the front cover of the April edition of the UK magazine Record Collector. A photo of each of them takes up the front cover with the headline, Let Them Be, The Beatles Solo, The Alternate Story. Okay? Uh, We mentioned Lawrence Juba before. Um, He is someone that you can now watch every day online as he's been treating us to a mini-concert from his home studio every day, including weekends, at 1.30 Pacific Time or 4.30 Eastern Time, usually performing two, sometimes three songs in these concerts, all wonderful to listen to. This is on Lawrence's Facebook page, Lawrence Juber. I know you've been watching some of those there, uh, Darren. Yeah, I've been trying to, I've been falling behind, though. I've been sharing them on my two Facebook pages and fell a few days behind and I really wanted to share them all and I still may kind of like, you know, double up some days. And so, you know, people who, you know, I'm acquainted with and friends of mine and whatnot who might not know Lawrence, uh, see all of these, uh, these, uh, these cool little mini sessions, uh, that he's been doing, which I've, I've, uh, really enjoyed. I was disappointed in the, you mentioning the virtual fest. I couldn't find Lawrence's performance on that Saturday, the virtual fest. I wasn't, I probably I was looking in the wrong place, obviously, but um, knowing that it's somewhere, you know, archived, um, right. I have to check that check that out. I was looking forward to watching it that Saturday and, and, and couldn't find it. I had some difficulties in streaming some of the events there. I couldn't get to see all of them, but very often um, I couldn't find certain events as right. they were starting. And there were times when um, the videos were freezing up on me. But right. like you said, as long as it's archived, then we can go back to them. Right. That's the best thing. So right. hopefully it's always going to be there. All right. Uh, an announcement here of a brand new book that just came out called The Walk Down Abbey Road by Denny Somak. And uh, this book is a celebration of the impact and influence the Beatles have had on their generation and the one that followed on both sides of the Atlantic. It contains interviews with major recording stars, including the Rolling Stones, Sting, Billy Joel, the Eagles, Steven Tyler, Brian Wilson, Jimmy Page, Elton John, David Bowie, and others who 
who were witness to history. A Walk Down Abbey Road also contains interviews with the four Beatles. And uh, what sets this book apart from all others is the wide variety of exclusive interviews, along with personal recollections and memories from major music personalities as told directly to the author. And uh, over the years, Denny Somak, in case you don't know, he syndicated a radio show that the legendary Scott Muni hosted called uh, Ticket to Ride. And there was a book that came out a few decades ago with that same title, Ticket to Ride. And the format's pretty similar to what this is. So I have a feeling that this is kind of like an updated version of that. And I've also been told that Mickey Dolenz has written the foreword to this book. So, um, again, it's called A Walk Down Abbey Road. Came out March the 9th by Denny Somak. In other news, Bob Dylan has just released a new 17-minute song on the assassination of President Kennedy. And it's called Murder Most Foul. And there are references in the song to the Beatles, Jerry and the Pacemakers, and The Who. Have either of you heard this? Oh, yeah. Oh yeah. In, in fact, I'm not even sure I'd say it's about the Kennedy assassination. It starts there and it gets back to there, but it's kind of about like everything, you know? I mean, it's like everything in the 60s uh and possibly beyond and and it's really interesting because it has almost no tune. Um it's almost spoken, but you know, you listen to it a couple of times and you begin to hear a tune-like thing in, you know, a Dylan context. But it's, uh, you know, I've listened to it a few times and I'm always surprised when it's over that, like, that was 17 minutes already, you know? There's, like, yeah, so much yes. going on in it. So, yeah. I think it's brilliant. I, I think it's brilliant. I, th- I think it was fantastic. And it was, you know, the first night I heard it, uh, I guess it came out on... Uh, uh, Friday or Saturday, but that's not, you know, neither here nor there, but it, I was listening to it at night and it just, you know, with the whole atmosphere of what we're going through right now with the, uh, the virus and the lockdown. And I've mentioned this, uh, uh, a few times to people that I live near a parkway and an interstate. And at night it is ridiculously quiet because normally there would be the din of cars out in the distance you know, going by on the parkway and the interstate and the trucks out on, on the interstate. And now it's like at night. Oh, sure. You know, it's like that. I mean, it, and I was listening to the first time I heard it, you know, at night at a low volume and it was just totally captivated me. And then I've listened to it a bunch of times since then. And it just, uh, I think it's going to be a uh, Dylan tune to be reckoned with in the years to come. Uh, mm-hmm. Hopefully it doesn't just sit, you know, here I go on my soapbox again about physical formats. Hopefully it's not just going to sit out in uh, cyberspace and that could be maybe, you know, made part of some compilation of some sort, uh, because I really think it was it was something special. And it's, you know, you're not the first person to say that, Alan, that when it's over, it's like that was 17 minutes, you know, because it moves. It moves somehow. It's moving. And you're not aware of it as it goes. And there's something new to discover each time you listen to it. Mm-hmm. So, and it's the first, uh, I didn't realize this. It's been about, I think, approximately six years since he put out original material. Because he's been doing the covers albums of late. Mm. You know, the standards albums. I think there's three in a row he did. And, you know, the Christmas album he had put out. Yeah, I think it's more yeah. than more than six years. It might be. I thought I thought it maybe he had retired from writing or something. That was the other reason I was so happy to see this. That you know, uh, maybe there's a new album of new material on the way. Don't know. And this actually is not newly recorded. It's something that's been in the can. Yeah. For he said know, a couple of years. Uh, than, yeah, I mean, you know, you'd figure it's somewhere in the five, six, seven, eight year range uh, that it's been sitting around the song. And it's only coming out now. It seems like the timing is perfect for something like yeah. this. Yeah. Is it more the, the vocal delivery of, of Bob Dylan's voice doing this? Is it kind of like trans-like? It has that. Tra- it's trans, tra- uh, trance-like is a very good way of describing it. It does hmm. sort of have that 
put you in that head, you know, in that head space. Mm. I find, at least it did for me. Mm. Okay. And so for right now, it's strictly a digital single. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. All right. Um, there's a new tribute song for Paul McCartney that's out. It's called Thank You, Paul. It's by a guy by the name of Coke. <laughs> C-O-K-E. <laughs> Belda. B-E-L-D-A. Hmm. And there are loads of titles of Paul songs from Another Day, Dear Boy, Dear Friend, Off the Ground, Some Days, Beautiful Night, and Take It Away in there. You can check it out on YouTube. Thank You, Paul, by Coke Belda. And Mark Hudson has posted a photo of him with Julian Lennon, taken from the sessions of a new album from Joey Molland of Badfinger. Mark is producing the album, and Julian is on it. And it is tentatively going to be called Be True to Yourself, with no release date as of yet. So Badfinger fans are probably anxiously awaiting this, a new album from Joey Molland. And uh, Mark involved, as is uh, Julian Lennon on that. Okay, and uh, that's it for all the news. Great. So let's move on to our main topic. As I said before, we're going to discuss what are for us uh, some of the disappointments from the Beatles in their solo careers. So we can pretty much go in any direction we want to on this. I didn't want to keep it strictly one from each Beatle, that kind of thing. Whatever we feel like saying, you know, it's, you know, it's up in the air. Uh, we're going to start with you, Darren, as this was oh, your idea. Isn't that great? <laughs> okay. 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 When I was making the list, my lists of disappointments, I found it was a little Paul heavy. And that's probably because from when I was uh, a little boy, McCartney's always been my favorite Beatle. I was more aware of uh as i got older through the 70s and i've pointed this out i was more aware of what wings were up to what paul was up to a bit more than the other three i mean i was aware of hits and albums coming out but it was you know i pretty much was uh really dedicated to mccartney so my list is a bit mccartney heavy so i'll start with paul and i, I wanted to you know when i suggested this I thought, you know, it didn't have to be an album. As you mentioned, Ken, it didn't have to be a single. It didn't have to be a physical release. It could have been a show or an event or something that uh, maybe there was build up and it let, you know, it let you down. So I, st I want to start off with, and I hope I have the year right. When Paul appeared on that special Saturday Night Live uh, that took place, I think, around Valentine's Day in 2014. It mm -hmm. could have been 2015. I'm not sure. But I know that um, Paul appeared and performed Maybe I'm Amazed. And I'm trying to remember now, maybe one of you could... could uh, th I, he may have done a second song as well. And uh, it was a Saturday, if I'm not mistaken. And it was a special... I don't know, was it an anniversary show? Yeah, Saturday it was their, for, their 40th anniversary show. So right, that, I think uh, Paul also performed. Yeah. And uh, and I thought, uh, you know, I was very disappointed with McCartney uh, because it was really for the entire like for primetime television audiences to hear what uh, how ragged his singing voice had become. And I was like, why did you pick Maybe I'm Amazed as the song to perform in this forum? Well, I uh, heard that that Lorne Michaels asked him to do that song because that must be a favorite of his. So that's probably why he did Still, that one. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> but, you know, I even felt sort of the same way about Paul Simon's performance. Uh, I'm like, oof, Paul's voice is taking a hit, too. Uh, and it's depressing. It made me sad, you know, because I don't want to, you know, I, I want to live in my own fantasy world uh, where we don't age. And, you know, and, and our heroes stay young and stay vibrant. And, you know, hearing Paul sing that night really... It made me sad. It made me depressed. And what was funny that night, that weekend, I was on a college tour with my daughter. Uh, we were taking her around to a few different colleges. Uh, it was the first trip we did of this sort. And we were uh, we had visited Syracuse University, McGill University, in Montreal and the University of Vermont in this weekend trip. And I was staying in the hotel where 
John and Yoko's bed in took place in Montreal, where Give Peace a Chance was recorded. So I'm staying in the hotel and watching McCartney on Saturday Night Live. And I was just so disappointed with the performance and how how uh, rough his voice sounded that night uh, doing Maybe I'm Amazed. Uh, so uh, that was the first thing I thought of when thinking about disappointments. And then I, I can't I can't help but forget the time that I heard the McCartney 2 album for the first time. And I think I brought this up on a, a prior show. Uh, 1980, I was 15 years old, and I still remember playing the McCartney 2 album. Got it, brought it home, got the 7-inch single. Uh, the bonus live version of Wings came um, with uh, the album. But yet, every song was seemed odder and more off the wall than the one before. And I didn't get it at that time. I didn't get what Paul was trying to do with McCartney too. Now I totally get it. I understand its place in his career, what his motivations were, how it was recorded, why it was recorded. Uh, but not, I didn't know any of this in 1980. Um, and I thought that maybe the studio, this part I don't really remember. I thought that the studio version of Coming Up might have just been a quirky tune, a quirky sounding song. But you know, McCartney too threw me for threw me for such a loop that I I kind of remember crying at the end, going, "Oh my God, what did Paul do?" <laughs> what you know, I, coming after Back to the Egg, it was I was not prepared <laughs> uh, for what McCartney too was. What's this bogey music and 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 waterfalls just kind of like was a a slog? Is that a word? Slog? Yeah. <laughs> And Summer's Day song. My opinion is completely changed of McCartney 2 now. But like I said, when I'm 15 years old and I'm excited, I come running home with the new Paul McCartney album. I don't quite understand why it's not a Wings album. But, you know, and I throw it on the turntable and it's like, what, what's going on? Has he lost his mind? <laughs> so uh, I had to mention that because that was a big disappointment that in time, like I said, I came to understand uh, what was going on there. And then honorable mentions with Paul. I don't want to get into details here, but, you know, in 1983, I had a very kind of like a, a block-headed view of music. I drew a very definite line in the sand on what was rock music and what was pop music. And I tended <laughs> not to like the pop stuff. I tended to be very much a rock guy. And that probably comes from, you know, being a disco sucks kid, you know. And, uh, you know, you liked rock and disco sucks. And there was no A and B to that. Uh, so when Paul McCartney starts collaborating with Michael Jackson, uh, that just completely, really like, oh, Ugh. what's he doing of course now again i've grown up and learned a bit more and opened my uh, scope up uh much wider than it was in 1983 but i was just kind of like coming to terms with working with stevie not being totally thrilled that they uh had and then michael jackson comes along and although i thought say 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 was catchy i really couldn't warm up to that collaboration uh but again that's where my head was at but that wasn't even disco. Uh, and also, just another disappointment on the Paul front. Uh, and, and Michael Jackson goes hand in hand with the Jackson 5, who came from a certain style of music that, hey, if I wasn't hearing it on WPLJ or WNEWFM in the mid-70s, it wasn't rock. Therefore, I wasn't interested. Hmm. Uh, this was how, you know, you know, I was ticking back when I was 10, 15, 17 years old. That's the influence. The of, yeah, the influence that? of radio. That's the influence of radio. Yeah, right there. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, true. Yeah, that's probably where this 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 like dividing line that I came up with, you know, came from. Very possibly. Mm -hmm. And in closing with McCartney, also his his uh, as much as I love to see him live, I really would love to kind of sit the amount of well lately it's slowed down, but. For a while there, he was just doing so much touring and playing live, and his voice just wasn't up to the task. 
And I almost wanted him to either retire from playing live or reduce the amount of shows he did to try to preserve the voice and make the shows more, for at least for me, enjoyable. I mean, I'm listening to him, you know, instead of really enjoying my, enjoying myself and jumping around, I'm like listening for cracks in his voice and, you know, nuances of more, you know, signs of him not being able to do what he did. So, uh, but I would still go see him every time he'd come through the New York City area. That, you know, is beside the point. But I was almost feeling like some of the shows, some of the tours the of the past... I'd say after the City Field shows in 2009, I started finding more and more being disappointed by uh, the condition of Paul's voice. And uh, so that's basically it with Paul. And the other three Beatles, I mean, a lot of it has to do with things that have come out in recent years, disappointments, Uh, especially with George and John. I'd have to say posthumous releases. There's been a bunch of releases from George and John that would that disappointed me. George, I mean, I think you guys might agree to this. I think a lot of George fans will agree that as happy as I have been with the albums, first the Dark Horse catalog, then the Apple catalog getting reissued, I think especially with the Dark Horse catalog, I mean, the bonus tracks left a lot to be desired. And I, I find myself even stopping the CDs when I'm listening to them uh, when the regular album part ends, so just kind of just forget about listening to the, the bonus tracks tacked on to the end. And uh, with that, the early takes volume one, uh, I think, was a disappointment. It could have been so much better and it could have been another volume or just one version, one like big double album or something. Uh, and also the Live in Japan album. I always felt that the sound, the, the performance was very sterile. And I was really looking forward to that album when it came out, hoping that it, you know, was going to lead to George touring North America in the 90s, which didn't happen. Here's George uh, and and Eric Clapton and his band. And it just felt, you know, too sterile, too clean of a of a sounding album. Uh, The mix was just almost like had no emotion to it. So those are the George ones. And uh, for John, I went also with posthumous releases. The first one that comes to mind, the acoustic album, uh, was really forgettable. And uh, also the, some of the remasters that Yoko was behind around the turn of the century, uh, especially taking liberties, re-evaluating uh, walls and bridges and sometime in New York City and... Uh, those two are the most obvious examples of this. Less so, say, mind games where there were some less subtleties in the mix. I wasn't thrilled about mix, uh, uh, remixes that were coming out. So, uh, you know, most of John's po- posthumous collections fail to knock me out. But the remasters, Yoko's, not remasters, I should be saying the remixes. Mm-hmm. The remixes from around the turn of the century and... Uh, the acoustic album, those stand out as being disappointments for me. And uh, and for Ringo, really, and I don't mean this to sound like I set the bar low for Ringo, but he's actually been consistently, uh, I've pretty much been pretty pleased with everything that Ringo's doing. Musically, the tours, all right, maybe you could bring it, make a case that he was, you know, stopped making... Uh, you know, the anticipation of who was going to be in the all-star band, that that anticipation kind of died down as years passed because the the additions were less exciting or they were repeating so often these band members coming back. Uh, but those are really picky. You know, most Ringo has probably disappointed me the least because his 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 his, his albums have been so consistently good. And it's really been kept, Ringo's kept it to that. Album, all-star band tour. And almost all the time, you come away thinking, you know, that was good. That I enjoyed that. No problems, you know, no complaints here. It was more of that with Ringo than with the other three, I think, where you oh. could pick apart reissues. You could pick apart a performance. So uh, to those, what, those are the ones I'm going to go with. Okay. Alan, do you want to comment about anything that uh, Darren just said? 
Um, there are probably a few things I would argue with here and there. Uh, I, I kind of like Yoko's remixes. Um, I also really like the original mixes, which she then put out again in 2010. I think actually in terms of reissues, while there, I, I kind of agree the acoustic album didn't really do much for me and, uh, and, and, and some of the others, but generally speaking, I think that her issue and reissue program has been really the most generous of, of all of them. I mean, Paul's coming close now with the archive series, but, you know, she has, I mean, if you include Lost Lennon tapes in there, which was, you know, she handed over a trove of material um, and they played tons of it. I mean, you know, there's like a 12 disc set of stuff that John did between 1975 and 1980, you know, in bootleg circles, which I kind of wish she had put out, <laughs> something like that of her own. But, you know, she has really, for, uh, given given the most unreleased stuff of, of anybody. And uh, so, yeah, I, I, so I would argue that about the, the, the remixes um, because, you know, th- the standard versions are out there too. And um, sometimes she's gone like really sort of radical was, you know, stripped double fantasy stripped. That's like a total, mm-hmm. you know, out there remix. Um, and, 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 and a lot of it is very enjoyable. I think, uh, you know, I, I, I might argue with your 15 year old feelings about, uh, McCartney too, but you seem to have come around on that. So there's yeah. n- no reason to, uh, <laughs> yeah. Mm. Uh, the dark horse and Apple boxes, I think, you know, there could have been more in the way of bonus tracks. And sometimes I, I think, especially in the dark horse set, some of the bonus tracks weren't even on the right CD for the period of the album. But, uh, you know, um, and and also early takes, I I really wish there was more of that. I wish there was at least one of those a year. Uh, I I agree that it could have been a double album the first time too. Um, but you know, there's a lot of unreleased George stuff that a lot of us would love to hear. And uh, you know, so in in a way that that's one of my disappointments too. So, but I liked what came out. You know, in a way, I didn't dislike yeah. early takes. Yeah, and the and in the case of early takes, the, the the material was fine. It just it was like it was so short, and it, I yeah, there could have been so much more. At least give us a mm. volume two, right? Uh, yeah, you know. So anyway, um, I just like to respond to what you had uh, just said, Darren, and uh, I have to say, early takes volume one is an absolute treasure for me. But I do agree with the two of you that um, there just wasn't enough material. There's just 10 tracks on there, but I love all of them. And I especially yeah. love when there's when there's tracks on there that you didn't even know existed. Like Let It Be Me was a real yeah. treat for me. Or Mama, You've Been On My Mind, that particular take. You have to think about whether or not some of that material was on Beware of Abco. But um, I think it was well done, but I think they could have given us more material. And yeah, I've been waiting every single year since then. Since the title says volume one, you'd think that he would continue or, you know, the Harrison family would put out more of that stuff. And like I said before, um, I did read an article with Giles Martin where he did say that he was working on, you know, a follow up to that. He was combing through the archives. So I don't know what happened there, but at least now we do know, based on uh, information that came out in the last few weeks, that um, the Harrison camp that they're working on. 50th anniversary, uh, uh, one for all things was passed, possibly for concert for Bangladesh, uh, living in the material world and something for the Dark Horse tour. But um, I do like a lot of the bonus tracks that have been on the Harrison CDs, although they have been skimpy. The things that I do like are the ones like, um, even though it's not a great sound quality, there was a demo of Mystical One that I like a lot on Don Trapo, something like that. Yeah, they haven't given you that much as far as bonus material. I will agree with you there. I did like the John Lennon acoustic album a lot, although much of it had already been released on the John Lennon anthology box set. But it was a nice concept to put together. I especially love that version of Cold Turkey that John did on acoustic guitar. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. 
so that was nice. And it was a very good point that you made there, Alan. I tend to think of when it comes to unreleased material, I'm so overwhelmed by all that McCartney has put out with his box sets. But yeah, once you put the Lost Linen tapes into the equation, Yoko has been extremely generous. And you add that to the John Lennon anthology box set. Also, the extra disc that came out with the signature box set um, and stripped down, like you said. You know, she's she's done quite a lot. And the Imagine box set, too. But, uh, yeah, um, as far as McCartney's voice in concert, look, we know that he doesn't sound like he did during the Wings Over America tour. And if you do listen online there are times when you'll find concerts in the last 10 years where he sounds fine and sometimes where his vocals sound ragged that's just how it's going to be i did hear by the way when paul did the interview with alan alda for his podcast show paul did mention that he's doing vocal exercises so i hope that that will improve um you know his singing in, in concert but um the guy gives you a three hour show. <laughs> you can't expect someone, especially at his age, to have the same power in his vocals that he once did in his 20s, 30s and 40s. And now he's he's coming close to 80. You can't expect the same thing. Still, he gives you so much for the money. And at this point, you're just grateful that he's doing anything live. And there's so many people around the world that haven't seen him at all or have rarely seen him that uh, you know, I just feel that we should be grateful that he's going out there and he's still enjoying it and giving you his all every single time. So, okay. Um, Alan, how about you? What have been your biggest disappointments overall from the solo deals? Okay. You know, and when we say big disappointments, it's not like these things have wrecked my life. You know what I mean? Um <laughs> But um, <clears throat> let's start with Ringo um, because it's a, a slightly odd one. And I, I kind of agree with Darren, you know. I mean, maybe I, I don't think it's really that expectations are lower for Ringo. I think that um, Ringo has done what he does and he's he's done it well. His voice is what it is. You either like it or you don't. And if you grew up, you know, here waiting for the odd, you know, one – track that he would have on each album it, you know it has a certain personality all that stuff i think you know his albums have been hit and miss but the parts of them that were pretty good i thought you know were you know definitely worthy definitely stand up and and i'm happy to listen to them what i wish though i mean i like the all-star band concept kind of i wouldn't have imagined him doing that as long as he's done it. What I was always disappointed that he didn't do is just get a band that's his band. You know, I saw him play twice with the Roundheads. I saw him, they were both at the bottom line in New York. And those were great shows. And that's the band that was playing on the records. And uh, I just thought, you know, this is good. Why doesn't he cultivate a band that's his band? He's the front man all the time. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think he would argue that, well, being the front man all the time, you really can wreck your voice, you know, given that his experience was singing one song a night uh, for a long time. But nevertheless, I mean, I thought the Roundheads were really good. And it just seemed to me that I wished he had a band that was his band that wasn't just a bunch of other old stars from the 60s and 70s. Not that I haven't enjoyed all-star band concerts when I've gone to them. I mean, I have. Um, it just is. It just seemed to me that artistically, this was a direction he should have maybe exploited from my point of view. The uh, Okay, we already talked about George's, um, you know, non-release of much unreleased material so we don't have to do that again for paul here's also an odd one you know there's yes there's his voice and all that stuff but you know being a uh, a classical guy on the other side of my life i think it disappointed me that while he was clearly interested in writing classical music and big pieces not just you know a lot of a lot of composers write 
mostly you know ten minute pieces these days, but he he wanted to take on the big forms, and he did, and he had help. What I think disappointed me is that in talking about them, he would always bring up how he didn't read music notation and um, didn't want to read music notation. And his, his reasons for not wanting to do it were, to me, really kind of silly because it's just like learning to write words, you know? It's, it's just a system of writing down your ideas. And, okay, he doesn't have to. He has a tape recorder he can sing into or, you know, maybe he has a memory good enough to remember some of these things. But... There's something that you, you also get from being able to notate because notating is also kind of a game, you know? You start notating and you, st you, you start doing some contrapuntal things that you, you, you kind of know how they're going to sound, but, you know, the pencil and paper may lead you in some directions that just sitting at the piano wouldn't necessarily. But apart from that, I mean, the... the the reason that he's sometimes given is um, he's talked about Leonard Bernstein somewhere from West Side Story. You know, there's a place for us. And he's always said, but, you know, I then someone told me that that's actually the theme of the slow movement of the Beethoven Second Piano Concerto. And I thought, well... And he would say, you know, well, if, if Leonard Bernstein would accidentally, you know, lift a bit from Beethoven, I mean, and he knows the repertory much better than I do. I mean, I'm likely to accidentally lift something, too, and I don't want to. But the thing is that it wasn't accidental. It was an homage. He, Leonard Bernstein knows the theme of the Beethoven Second Piano Concerto slow movement, and he he molded that into somewhere, you know, and it doesn't steal at all. It just steals a bit which is also out of copyright. But what, what struck me as silly about it is that it is exactly the same exercise that Paul did when he wrote I'm Down to replace Long Tall Sally as the Beatles' set closer. I mean, no one goes to him and says, wow, you know, you stole, accidentally stole Little Richard because everybody knows that it's an homage to Little Richard. You know, it's, 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 deliberate, just like Leonard Bernstein was. So I think that he's sort of, you know, giving an excuse about, you know, being afraid for something to happen that, you know, didn't happen in the first place. And I, I just kind of, I just kind of wish that he had learned that skill if he's going to be writing classical music, not be dependent on bringing in other composers to notate it for you, you know? That's part of the job in a way, you know, getting to know what instruments can do, getting to know how to notate it in a way that will make sense to the people playing it. Because, you know, anything can be notated in a number of ways, but you want them not to be, you know, sitting there with a slide rule trying to figure out what you mean. So, um, hmm. so that's I just, think that mm -hmm. Paul, I think Paul likes to present himself as someone where all of his talent is just pure, natural, instinctual, that he doesn't have to be trained on anything, you know? And I think that um, when you realize that's who he is, a lot of people are more impressed with that. Well, <laughs> well, okay, but the flaw in that argument is that he learned how to write English, he learned how to play chords on a guitar, he learned how to play bass lines. This is just another way of, it's just another musical skill that can make things easier for you and also cheaper. You know, you don't have to hire Richard Rodney Bennett, which you can't now because he just died a few months ago. But, um, you know, <laughs> see what I'm saying? But something <laughs> like bass, he learned all by himself. Okay. You can learn notation <laughs> by yourself, too. You don't need someone yeah. sitting there telling you this is G on this line. Uh -huh. you, can, you can figure that out the same way. Right. Anyway, okay. Uh, let's see if I had anything. Yeah, you know, with um, with John, you know, I don't have very many disappointments um, because, as I said, you know, Yoko's been really good about getting the stuff out. I mean, I'm sorry that he, in a way, did so little that was released publicly, but we know because of the Lost Lennon tapes that he did a whole lot that wasn't released publicly. I can't say I'm disappointed really that she didn't put out the 12 disc set of demos um, that have been bootlegged, but uh, you know, it's something that could happen. 
you know, Sean could do it or, you know, she may still have something like that in mind. You know, who knows? But one thing while he was alive that I've, I've never totally warmed up to some time in New York City. Um, I know what he was trying to do and maybe a song or two here and there, you know, is, is okay. But as an album, when it came out, I was really disappointed. It, it seemed very half-baked. And among all his work, you know, together and you listen to it all together now sometime in new york city is is the one that just doesn't quite do it for me mm-hmm. although i like the live album <laughs> that comes with it you know that stuff's okay all right so that's everything i think so all right darren any comments on what uh, alan just said yeah you don't know what you're talking about alan no, I'm just, I'm just I thought you were going to say, oh, no, he put me to sleep. Yeah. No, <laughs> I agree with you about sometime in New York City, and I was going to put that down. Uh, but, you know, because because my disappointments were Len intended to all be, you know, uh, the posthumous releases and remixes and, and whatnot, I decided, all right, I'm not going to attack any individual album. That would be the only one I would probably uh, bring up. But I didn't own or hear it from beginning to end until after john died i'm sorry to say hmm. i i kind of remember not long after john died after the holidays in early 81 you know going to the record store and realizing all right i got to do something about this i've got some money here i got to fill in the the catalog i got to fill in my collection and buying plastic ono band imagine rock and roll and sometime in new york city uh, all in one shot and uh, sometime in New York City didn't work listening to it for the first time in 1981. Uh, topically uh, alone, the album was sort of had become passe because these were old news items. I mean, it didn't hold up even topically, mm-hmm. let alone it just sounded like just such a sloppy album in so many different levels. That That's the one thing that you mentioned, Alan, the classical stuff, because I don't have a classical ear. They've always, on the surface, sounded really good and enjoyable. But I'll be the first one to say, you know, I don't have a classically trained ear to say, "Mm, you know, this isn't really what, you know. I'm not really talking about the works. I'm just talking about, a, you know, like a a, a side issue there. You know, the works, um, some I like more than others, but... um, Right. You know, I like Liverpool Oratorio a lot. And, um, you know, some of the shorter pieces he's done, too, are actually pretty good. Standing Stone less so. Although, you know, when I listened to it again recently, I liked it a lot more than I did when it came out. Um, but the the writing issue is, is it's really just about, you know, a particular... I don't, I don't know that those pieces would necessarily have been a lot better or a lot worse or whatever if he could do right. it. it. It just you know, side issue, like I said. Right. right. Mm. Okay. Yeah. That, that's basically it from my thoughts there. Okay. So I guess it's my turn. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, as far as the solo Beatles music is concerned, I'm really never disappointed. I've enjoyed every solo Beatles album. That doesn't mean I love every single song. But um, like any other artist, you have your favorite albums, what you consider the best and what you consider to be their weakest. And I like Sometime in New York City for a number of reasons. I happen to like the edginess of it, the rawness of it, having Elephant's Memory as the backup band. It was a different feel from the other Lennon albums. Um, And I don't really care about the whole idea of whether or not a song is dated or not. It has no effect on me and, and whether or not I like it now. I can hear songs about other people from the past uh, that are no longer here, uh, like Hurricane from Bob Dylan, and, and enjoy it and not think that it's dated, you know, or not care whether or not it's dated. I don't, it doesn't really matter that much to me. I love them as songs. And I also like Yoko's material on Sometime in New York City, as well as the Double Fantasy and Milk and Honey. Uh, material from her Mm -hmm. but anyway um i have a few uh disappointments from uh, the solo beatles this more applies to paul and john more paul than john 
But I wish that more work was done with the super talented musicians that Paul has worked with and John, people like Stevie Wonder, people like Michael Jackson. You know, when I love a song like Ebony and Ivory or Say, 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 or with George Michael, Heal the Pain, or uh, you could even go back to the Rock Estra lineup. You had so many great musicians working with Paul. I wish that he had done more with those people. Somebody like Stevie Wonder, who I think the world of, I would give anything for Paul to make a full album with Stevie Wonder. And you know that those two guys have nothing but the greatest respect for each other. So to have two songs with Paul and Stevie, I'm grateful for. I just wish that they had done more. And I just think that the chemistry between Paul and Stevie or Paul and Michael, or in the case of um, on Press to Play, Pete Townsend and Phil Collins on Angry, I love the song, but you know, you got Pete Towns in there. <laughs> you got Phil Collins there. Do something more with them. And you never know. It could have been a case of they only had one day to spend or that they can spare at the time hmm. uh, to work with Paul. You don't know what the circumstances were. But Paul knows all these very talented people. And I just wish that if you've got all these people, it's like I mean, take, for example, the Rockestra lineup. To just do the Rockestra theme and so glad to see you here. And you've got some of the greatest talent in rock and roll in the room with you wouldn't you want to make an album <laughs> wouldn't you want to make several yeah. tracks with those people instead of just a couple of songs and don't get me wrong i love those songs i have no problem with the music that they put out i just wish that given the, the high caliber of talent i wish that they had done more likewise with john and i feel funny complaining about anything with john because let's face it his life was robbed so much great music we we were robbed of. And, you know, on, on top of all that, I, I wish that John had toured. We know that he was thinking about touring with Elephant's Memory. That stopped because of the investigation that was done on him from, uh, you know, the FBI on him, you know, trying to deport him and all. Mm -hmm. And John and Yoko were, were planning to tour after Double Fantasy, and we were robbed of that. So it's very tough for me to even complain about anything where John is concerned. But considering the fact that he worked out so well with Elton John, with mm. whatever gets you through the night and surprise, mm -hmm. surprise, and doing Lucy in the Sky, you know that Elton John would have given anything to make an album with John Lennon. Mm. You know, mm. he, he just thought the world of John Lennon, as did David Bowie. And I love fame. And I love when they worked on it across the universe. You know, when I when I heard those collaborations, I love them. I just wish that they, there could have been more. Same thing with Harry Nilsson. You know, John Lennon loved Harry Nilsson. Wish they could have worked more together. And that's all I have to say about that. You know, it's not a complaint about the music itself. It's just you wish that with all these great talents that um, they could have done more with them. Mm -hmm. With Paul... I've noticed that once he stops working with people, that's it <laughs> for the <laughs> most part, with the exception of Ringo or George Martin. He brought back at times or Dave Gilmore a few times. Mm -hmm. uh, there are certain people that I wouldn't mind if he went back and work with again, maybe different members of Wings. I'd love to see him with Denny Lane again or with Eric Stewart or Elvis Costello. But once the relationship seems to stop, he never goes back to those people. And considering the fact that I love the songwriting that he did with Elvis Costello, Eric Stewart, and Denny Lane, I think it would be a good thing once in a while to just go back and work with them, mm -hmm. as well as youth. Uh, we don't know if there's ever going to be another Fireman album or not. With George, huh, I wish he toured more often, but we all know what happened with the 74 tour. He was criticized because his voice was so hoarse, and I think he never recovered from that. He always soured on touring after that. Mm -hmm. which is why he didn't tour until he experimented with Eric Clapton and did the tour of Japan. It's just uh, between John and George, I've said it quite often, you have to treasure every live performance from the two of them because they, they were you know, scarce. And it's, right. um, it's very sad in, in that regard. I wish George enjoyed performing more often. I treasure when he was with Paul Simon on Saturday Night Live, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, that's another great collaboration there I wish could have happened. Yeah. Um, with Paul and Ringo, I've said this a million times, the material on their set list 
I wish that they would go deeper into their catalogs. I think ever since the 1989-90 tour, Paul has become Beatle Paul, and he's been relied way too much on Beatles material. And I think it was certainly great in 89-90 because there's so much stuff the Beatles never did live, and he started to embrace all that stuff, as he should. But sometimes I think he just overdoes it with the Beatles stuff, and I wish that his, his uh, set lists were more balanced between all the different decades to show pride in everything that he's done. And it tends to be like 60% Beatles, a handful of wing songs, his new album, and maybe a few other songs like the tributes. And that's become his tour. But then again, like I said, I'm grateful that he does anything at this point. Sometimes I wonder why I should even complain, but um, <laughs> really, it's, 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 it's the truth. Because, well, that's because I, I forced it, you to. It's yeah, Darren's fault. <laughs> yeah, I forced you to come up with negative stuff for this show. <laughs> yeah, you were saying Ken is never negative. We've got to do something about this. And it's the same thing with Ringo. Ringo plays it safe. He usually does the same songs of his back catalog. And you're lucky if he plugs his new album. And if he does, it tends to be one song. Yeah. You know, good point. it's. it's uh, it's a shame. And there's a lot of songs in particular from his past that would work really well live. You know, I actually think Snookaroo would be a great song for him yeah. to do live. There are certain songs that I could really hear. And uh, I do agree with you, Alan, about wishing that Ringo would have his own band like when he had the Roundheads. I just think that he's too insecure to go out with his own band, thinking how many people are going to pay to see mainly him. And even though the All-Star Band... He is the, the ringleader. There's no doubt about that. But, you know, part of the appeal is to see all these different superstars together in one band, to see them interact. All the songs are songs you know and love. And um, it's a safe way to go out. And most of the shows that Ringo's done have been sellout shows. So it's been a winning formula. He doesn't want to break that formula. I'd love to see him do an all-star country band, considering how great his voice is or very suitable for country music. And you know, he loves country music. Mm -hmm. I'd love to see him shake things up a little bit. He hasn't changed his, his, uh, his band for quite a while now with the exception of, you know, what's happened in the last few years, but he still has Steve Lukather and Greg Raleigh there. And, and Greg Bissonette is absolutely fantastic as a drummer. So, um, you know, there haven't been too many changes with the all-star band lineup. I wish he would, change that up a little bit as much as i love the band of the last i guess it's what almost a decade and even though i am not someone that ever really wished for a beatles reunion truly i do wish that paul had tried to work with george a little bit only because of the fact that well when it comes to paul and his solo music he only really worked with ringo and so i know that when cloud nine came out and George had all the success. Paul was hinting that he might like to write with George. I don't know if he put that out there just to get attention. But um, yeah, it would have been interesting just for Paul and George to try and write something together. I mean, you've got in spite of all the danger, but that's not a real collaboration. And there, there was the possibility, as we've heard, that John was thinking about working with Paul during Venus and Mars. Mm -hmm. It would have been nice if John and Paul did anything together. I've never really truly wished for the four of them to reunite because to me, they did enough, you know, to ask for anything more would be, you know, asking for way too much. I'd only want them to reunite if they truly wanted to. But the collaborations that didn't happen, like Paul working just with George, I'd be more curious about that than, well, I would love to have seen John and Paul together, too just to see what they would have come up with without George and Ringo. You know, that would have been kind of interesting. But, um, yeah, I think that's just about it, really. Okay. Uh, I, I, uh, I liked all, all um, uh, you know, the, the collaboration, the idea of the collaborations would be great. Uh, the one thing I, I just want to say, I always got the impression that Paul didn't ultimately like having somebody to basically say no to him right, uh, or, or at least knock him out of his comfort zone. John Lennon, I think, was the only one that ultimately that Paul was okay with 
well, Paul had no choice, obviously. I mean, but I think that, that he started with the best when it came to collaborating. And after that, uh, as he established himself as truly a solo artist, uh, I don't think collaborations and Paul McCartney are, are necessarily a good mix, ultimately, for him, not for us. You know, I, it just seems like, you know, he'll do these one-off things, as you pointed out, Ken, but... You know, as for working with people more than once or a third or fourth time, it doesn't happen because I just don't think McCartney wants to be told or wants to share an idea or something like that. I could be wrong. I mean, that's that's one observation. But I know that I pointed out one time here on this show, and I thought it was one of the most telling things that Paul ever said. There was an interview that he gave to Joe Smith. Uh, an industry veteran who just recently passed away. He put out a book called Off the Record, and there's all these wonderful interviews in the book, most of them fairly short. But there was one in there with Paul where he said, let's face it, Denny Lane is not John Lennon. Stevie Wonder is not John Lennon. Eric Stewart is not John Lennon. And I think this interview was done before Elvis Costello, before working with him. But I thought that really revealed something about Paul that maybe... You know, he measures all these people up to John, and nobody can take John's place in his yeah, eyes. Well, yeah, if he so, does that, that explains a lot, and it's probably not the right way to go about. You know, <laughs> that's, that's true. true. <laughs> that's true. I mean, come on, these people are very talented people. You know, Denny Lane, Stevie Wonder is the genius. You know, uh, Eric Stewart, Elvis Costello's fantastic. Definitely, you El- know, definitely, yeah. Elvis Costello. I could see Elvis being Lennon-like, uh, <laughs> at least when it comes to songwriting. Uh-huh. Uh huh. And he would be like the first person I'd really like to have seen the two of them do a lot more together, because I really think there's a there's a Lennon quality to Elvis Costello. Definitely, definitely. Um, you know, Paul's. Uh, once they get into arguments in collaborations, it, it always seems to come down to, yeah, well, how many, how many number one records have you written? Um, mm. And he wouldn't have been able to say that to John. But that notwithstanding, I think that if we're talking about post Beatles breakup, I'm not sure Paul would have tolerated criticism directly from John either in sessions. I mean, he took it when John would say it in interviews, but, um, you know, if, if John had gone down to work on Venus and Mars with him, which from what I've heard came really close to happening, but he then went back with Yoko and I guess that was his choice. You know, this is more important to me than going down to new Orleans and being in these sessions. Um, mm. But I suspect that if he did go down there and they had a dispute, I think Paul, at that point, you know, we're talking about 1975, um, how many albums behind him already, it's still things like Thrillington still in the can, you know, lots of stuff. I think he would have thought, you know what, you can't talk to me like that anymore. That's just my guess. But um I, mm. I I think it wouldn't have suddenly been time to be deferential to John again because I was when I was fifteen, you know. Interesting. It's hard for me to envision that. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. I don't know. He was always so respectful of John, you know. Yeah. So I, I sometimes I think there was no one that he respected more than John. It could be. And uh you know, uh, it could. We also raise the possibility that maybe Paul. Uh, we're turning into psychiatrists here. Maybe Paul didn't want to get have anybody that he could ever be as close to as he was with John. Mm-hmm. I so, would. Li- I would like to have you know eavesdropped on a session in say 1971 or so where John walks in and says, "Paul, bip bop." Are you serious? <laughs> <laughs> uh, We're not going to do Blade Bip Bop again. <laughs> Actually, it sounded like Stonehenge I was going to do. But <laughs> but anyway, right. so uh, those are our uh, disappointments. And like Alan said, we're not losing sleep over them. 
you know, sometimes I just feel like yeah. the Beatles have blessed us with so much great music and so many great memories. What is there to complain about? But we found a few things. So uh, <laughs> I certainly hope that our listeners don't mind these criticisms. But um, it was great to talk about this. And they should have so, put us in charge. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So why don't we go around and give everyone our contact information. And we'll start with you, Darren. All right. Well, uh, I'm at WFUV in New York City. And uh, uh, with the pandemic, the coronavirus pandemic right now, things are a little uh, screwy, uh, not only at WFUV, but around the world, uh, it seems like. Uh, so my some of my air shifts have altered temporarily. Uh, so just in a nutshell, I'll say WFUV in New York City is at 90.7 FM and 90.7 FM HD2. Or you could stream WFUV anywhere at WFUV.org. The other option is to get the app. Download WFUV's app. That's another easy way to listen to WFUV anywhere you are. But in the New York City area, it's 90.7 FM and uh, 90.7 FM HD2 for the three or four of you who are still into HD radio. And you can email me at Darren DeVivo at WFUV.org. Uh, your other option is to go to Facebook. I'm always on Facebook. Uh, they're going to rename it Darren book soon. Uh, and I have two pages. Go to WFUV.org. No, the, wait a minute. That's the website for the radio station. Go to Darren DeVivo on WFUV radio. That's my radio page. Click like, and uh, we'll be hooked up. And, uh, that's, that's about it. I think. All right. I like what you said about the three or four people who listen to HD radio. Yeah, I, think, I never, under, you know, I think HD, it's nice, but does anyone like listen on mm. HD? I don't know. Well, you, sure reminded me, you reminded me of John there when he was with Dennis Elsis on WNEW. For yeah. what, for the two people that listen to Quad? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, a lot uh, of cars have, I guess, HD but I don't know how many people actually flip around to see what else is happening. Mm. I don't know. So many choices out there. So little time. <laughs> Alan, how about you? Okay. Um, there are two of me on Facebook, Alan Cozen and Alan Cozen Remixed. Um, you can reach me at either one of those. Uh, Remixed is more Beatles-related kind of stuff and the plain old Alan Cozen is more of my classical stuff and other things, but you know what? Might be fun to read them both. Uh, you can reach all of us collectively by email at things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. That's things we said today, radio show, one word at gmail.com. We have a Twitter feed, which is at things we said fab. That's at things we said fab. And we also have a group Facebook page or two. The main one is things we said today, Beatles radio fans. Uh, but there is also a plain old things we said today page. And uh, you know, actually, I, I post the shows mainly to things we said today, Beatles radio fans, but I usually then share them to the other things we said today page too. So you can find the shows either way, also on Podbeam, on iTunes, and I think there are various other places too. Okay. Hey, Darren, I don't know if you noticed, but did you hear Alan singing before? <laughs> no. <laughs> he was singing. What song did you sing, Alan, before? Leonard Bernstein Somewhere from West Side Story. Yeah. I oh, told yeah, you. oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that yeah, was when people that. knew how to write, write musicals, you know. Okay. I'm telling you, he's, he's practicing for the Andrew Lloyd Webber uh, tryout here. <laughs> oh, I'm writing down. Oh, I'm going to put him in from memory right now. Okay. <laughs> All right. For me, Ken Michaels, you can reach me at my email address, which is everylittlething at att.net. Uh, my website is kenmichaelsradio.com. Don't forget, there's loads of interviews with people in the Beatle world, including Alan Cozen from many years ago, from when I interviewed him for his book, Got That Something. Mm. You can find that 
on the website, um, as well as my Beatles trivia and games page, where you can win one of nine prizes every single week. I just did an interview with Ted Montgomery, who's the author of the Paul McCartney catalog, a complete annotated discography of solo works, 1967 through 2019. And you can find that on the interviews page four page of my website. As far as every little thing, the live show, it's a dead show right now because uh there's no live broadcasting at wnhu where i normally do my show on wednesday nights that's indefinitely until uh this nightmare ends of the uh coronavirus uh, my syndicated show you can catch on many radio stations and you can look up uh what radio stations they are and their broadcast times and have links to the different uh radio stations websites on the Every Little Thing page of my website. Plus, I have the talk show podcast called Talk More Talk, which is all about the solo Beatles. And that happens every other Monday night at 9 p.m. Eastern. The next show happens to be next Monday night, April the 6th, uh, on our Facebook page, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. You can join me, Kid O'Toole, Tom Bunyadi, and me, Mr. Mayo. And we'll be tackling Ringo's very first solo album, Sentimental Journey, which just a few days ago celebrated its 50th anniversary. We'll be doing that next Monday night. You can write in with comments as we're doing the show. So all that is what's been going on with me. All right. Just wanted to make mention of the fact that I'm going to be a guest on the Two Legs podcast. Uh, and that will be uh, this week, I believe, at some point later on this week. As you're listening to this show, go look for Two Legs. And uh, I'm a special guest on that one as well with Tom and Andy. That's right. Tom Hunyadi, who does the show Talk More Talk With Me, is one of the right. co-hosts on Two Legs, along with Andy Nichols. And you're talking about what, Darren? Uh, the topic basically was uh, surrounding... The three wing singles, their first three singles that all came out in 1972. And we briefly touch on the Wildlife album and and uh, but mainly look at, uh, you know, those three singles, kind of just discuss them. Why weren't there any singles off of Wildlife? That kind of thing. So it's like the early wings period is the topic. So, And why weren't there any singles off the first McCartney album? <laughs> Couldn't tell you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We'll save that for this show. Okay. All right. So this has been great. Thanks so much for tuning in. And for Alan Cozen, Darren DeVivo, and myself, Ken Michaels, thank you all for listening. And we will see you next time. Bye. Before? Leonard Bernstein somewhere from West Side Story. Yeah. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That I was when people that. knew how to write, write musicals, you know. Okay. I'm telling you, he's, he's practicing for the Andrew Lloyd Webber uh, tryout here. <laughs> oh, I'm writing down. Oh, I'm going to put him in for memory right now. Okay. <laughs> All right. For me, Ken Michaels, you can reach me at my email address, which is everylittlething at att.net. Uh, my website is kenmichaelsradio.com. Don't forget, there's loads of interviews with people in the Beatle world, including Alan Cozen from many years ago, from when I interviewed him for his book, Got That Something. Mm. You can find that on the website, um, as well as my Beatles trivia and games page, where you can win one of nine prizes every single week. I just did an interview with Ted Montgomery, who's the author of the Paul McCartney catalog, a complete annotated discography of solo works, 1967 through 2019. And you can find that on the interviews page four page of my website. As far as every little thing, the live show, it's a dead show right now because uh there's no live broadcasting at wnhu where i normally do my show on wednesday nights that's indefinitely until uh this nightmare ends of the uh, coronavirus uh, my syndicated show you can catch on many radio stations and you can look up uh what radio stations they are and their broadcast times and have links to 
the different uh, radio stations' websites on the Every Little Thing page of my website. Plus, I have the talk show podcast called Talk More Talk, which is all about the solo Beatles. And that happens every other Monday night at 9 p.m. Eastern. The next show happens to be next Monday night, April the 6th. Uh, on our Facebook page, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. You can join me, Kid O'Toole, Tom Bunyadi, and me, Mr. Mayo. And we'll be tackling Ringo's very first solo album, Sentimental Journey, which just a few days ago celebrated its 50th anniversary. We'll be doing that next Monday night. You can write in with comments as we're doing the show. So all that is what's been going on with me. All right. Just wanted to make mention of the fact that I'm going to be a guest on the Two Legs podcast, uh, and that will be uh, this week, I believe, at some point later on this week. As you're listening to this show, go look for Two Legs, and uh, I'm a special guest on that one as well with Tom and Andy. That's right. Tom Hunyadi, who does the show Talk More Talk With Me, is one of the right. co-hosts on Two Legs, along with Andy Nichols. And you're talking about what, Darren? Uh, the topic basically was uh, surrounding the three wing singles, their first three singles that all came out in 1972. And we briefly touch on the Wildlife album and and uh, but mainly look at, uh, you know, those three singles, kind of just discuss them. Why weren't there any singles off of Wildlife, that kind of thing. So it's like the early wings period is the topic. So, And why weren't there any singles off the first McCartney album? <laughs> Couldn't tell me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll save that for this show. Okay. All right. So this has been great. Thanks so much for tuning in. And for Alan Cozen, Darren DeVivo, and myself, Ken Michaels, thank you all for listening. And we will see you next time. Bye. Bye.